Hello there. So this is the April edition of the Drawing the Ideal Self podcast. I was thinking about the kind of topics that we've had on here and the things I've got planned coming up. And I thought we haven't paid much attention to learning. And given in particular that children and young people are in a situation where they are sort of obliged to learn, you know, that's what school's about. Uh, And if they don't learn, people start to get very frustrated and worried about them. I thought it might be worth having a look at that. And in particular, looking at reading, because that's a core skill required by schools and required by life. So when we're in school, what seems to be expected of us is that we're able to learn all of the subjects. And if people make an assumption about our ability in whatever kind of way that is, either if it's not very good or we're a high flyer, people have expectations that we'll always be able to perform at a similar kind of level, it seems. So they get a bit worried if somebody doesn't fit with that. And I suppose what that's drawing attention to is the importance of the average, the domination of the idea that people are going to proceed along in some kind of orderly, normal, in inverted commas, way. And when they don't, it's because there's a problem with either how the information is presented or the learning that they do or the teaching style. What's less important from the system point of view is why people would want to learn, why young people want to learn, let's say, design. If they don't see it as relevant to them, are they going to be learning or are they going to be sitting through a lesson, writing stuff down, trying to remember it because the teacher said so, but not really applying that information and then therefore eventually becoming creative with it. And I can remember when I was at school having struggles with some subjects and there were a number of components for that. One was the content of the subject, which I didn't find very exciting. Uh, Another would be the teacher delivering the subject, who I found usually boring in presentation style. And the other would be thinking that it wasn't relevant. It wasn't something I wanted to learn about, particularly at certain points in life. The other thing, though, was my view of myself as a learner. And that came about gradually, as it does for all of us. Uh, And somehow it ended up with me having some ideas that there were certain things I was good at and certain things I was not going to be able to do. Um, That's been proved wrong at various points in my life when I've had a more open idea about what I could learn and how I might learn it. So I would argue that actually working with a young person to explore their view of learning is a really important part of any assessment of any kind of learning difficulty. If young people don't see themselves as able to learn or able to learn a particular subject, then that's going to affect what they do. If they don't see themselves as fitting into a school or a class or with a particular teacher, then that's going to affect what they do. So the the actual act of learning in the lesson, you know, as an individual is a process. It's about information being presented to you and whether or not you take it on board. And if you take it on board and you can fit it with other stuff you already know, then maybe you're learning. If you can't take it on board or you don't want to, or it's difficult for you to do that because you can't see how it fits, then maybe you won't be learning. So in order to do today's episode, I reread a paper which is really very old now, called Reading Difficulties and What Else? And it's by Tom Ravenette. And you'll know so far in the podcast, I'm a big Tom Ravenette fan. And I was quite amused when I read it because the language in it is of 1969. um, And I'd forgotten that about it. So, you know, the language in it, if you read it, I would say you need to be ready to hear how people talked about young people in those days. However, what's great about Tom's paper is that even though he was using the language which was expected in those days, for instance, talking about someone being retarded in reading, and we wouldn't use that language now, 
what he wasn't saying is there are people who can't learn to read. He also was saying if someone isn't making progress in reading, it's not enough to say that they don't fit into the average pattern and therefore they have a difficulty with reading because that doesn't tell you at all anything about what their difficulty is with reading. You may be able to say that their phonological awareness isn't very good or they can't remember sight vocabulary or any of that stuff. However, that's not telling you why they don't. Um, And what Tom argues in that paper is the danger of looking at groups for research and making conclusions from that and then not paying attention to individuals who are still individuals. You know, there may be group averages, etc. That doesn't tell you about this one child you've got sitting in front of you. Um, So as a quote, I like this bit. So he says, individuals, unlike objects in the physical world, are complex and unique. In consequence, the research strategies devised for investigating people are aimed at discovering concepts derived from groups rather than from single individuals. But the group is not comparable to the individual and concepts relevant to the whole group are not necessarily relevant to the individual in that group. Thus, if on average a group of retarded readers shows lower scores on, for example, a test of visual perception than a comparable group of normal readers, it does not mean that every child in the retarded group is inferior to every child in the normal group. In fact, the overlap is usually very great and the statistical significance of research findings need have no psychological significance. He goes on to say, The most basic assumption underlying the study of groups, however, is at a different level and is far more important. For scientific study, individuals are treated as if they were objects, not as individuals. If the object did not have this supposed deficit, the object would perform equally well in comparison to other objects that did not have this deficit. The therapeutic task is to remove the deficit, but the individual is a living, breathing, evaluating, thinking, feeling, acting organism. He chooses, decides, acts upon his wishes and grows. What he achieves will be related to all of these attributes. At the simplest level, when invited to undertake an activity, He can either do it with delight, see it as irrelevant or consider it a waste of time. He can view it with active distaste or be frightened of its implications. Scientific study has not yet come to terms with the object as subject, but in real life, in the classroom, in front of the teacher, the child is indeed fully a subject and he approaches the task he is expected to master with well-developed cognitive, affective and cognitive attitudes. The results of scientific inquiry lead to description, not to explanation, nor to understanding. Their certainties are probabilities, not absolute truths, and general, not absolute. If, then, traditional research strategies are of little value at the individual level, what should be done? So. That's interesting. And I think it it draws attention to the fact that all of us are individuals and that we will bring ourselves to that learning interaction with a teacher. We can't not be ourselves. We might be versions of ourselves, but we will still be a person and we will still have our own priorities and our own ways of seeing things, which make it more or less easy to tackle the project, whatever that might be. Tom goes on to say, behaviour is itself a communication, a confirmation or disconfirmation of others' view of us, or a request for confirmation or disconfirmation. Learning and non-learning are each aspects of behaviour, and as such may be seen as communications. Both views, behaviour as communication and behaviour as experiment, imply the presence of other individuals. 
on the one hand it is people who confirm or disconfirm, and on the other hand a person's behavioural experiments involve the anticipation of what others do. Thus people, parents, teachers, siblings and peers become important factors when the individual is seen as either experimenter or communicator, and when learning and not learning are seen as experiments or communications. The adoption of these points of view may provide starting points for that new sensibility which is needed in the understanding of reading difficulties. So the investigation of reading difficulties would need to be personal. It's got to be about why that child sees themselves as somebody who's having a difficulty with reading, if they do. And that's an interesting question in itself, because sometimes everybody else is worried about somebody's progress with literacy and the child isn't worried at all. But you won't know that unless you have a conversation with them. As far as they're concerned, they may be going along nicely and unaware of the progress of others or not notice that they are behind by a long way. We can't assume that they do know that, so we need to check it out. Without having a conversation with the young person about themselves as a reader in this case, how are we going to know how they see themselves? And that conversation can be facilitated using various PCP techniques, but it's absolutely crucial. So if you think of something like being faced with a page of text and looking at it and thinking, I don't know what that says, I can work out some bits of it. You know, what does that do to your construing of self? How does it validate or invalidate personal construing? So if a child expects not to be able to learn, they may look at that, bothers them a great deal because here's more evidence of not being able to learn. Or they see it as irrelevant because they are not someone who can learn. Tom goes on to argue that actually any formulation of a reading difficulty isn't really valuable in itself unless something can be done in relation to it. So he says formulation is of no value unless it has implications for action. That's quite a challenge because sometimes people can make formulations, someone's behind with their reading. But the action doesn't relate necessarily to trying to address the issues to explore why someone's behind with their reading and what that's going to entail. It may be that just a new programme is tried. So there's an assumption that the programme is wrong. I would say there needs to be a step between that, which is having a conversation with a child at the very least once about themselves as reader. I had an interesting experience with this in my own house. So my oldest son um, really loved stories when he was a little boy. So he's adopted. He arrived with us at the age of four and always, always loved stories, loved films, loved TV because of the stories, but loved books. So we would go to the library and uh, I took all of our library cards and we'd get about 12 books on each card because they were children's books. Um, so we'd come home with a car full of books and he would work his way through them. You know, initially, when he was little, we would read to him. And then it came to the point where he was learning to read in school and he was clearly finding it frustrating and difficult. Well, the good thing about him in terms of being a reader was that he always saw himself as enjoying stories. And there was a point where I became very worried about him when he said to me, I don't want to go to the library anymore. You can go without me. So I went with his sister and don't bring me any books. I don't want any more books. I only want videos. Um, shows how long ago that was. But he didn't want to have the experience of reading. So my son had always been read to. We'd read all the way through. And what happened as he got older and his sister got older, who was younger, is she started to learn to read on her own. She really taught herself and he couldn't do it. Um, so we were very concerned about that and we discussed it with the school. And what the school said was he was reading fine on the reading scheme. So he was doing the chip books and he loved them. But to be honest, the stories were very, very simple. 
and he could read them. And what I discovered one day is that he knew the stories and he could remember them. And I found that out because he recited one in his sleep. So I then started to read the books for practice backwards. So we we cover the picture up and start on the last page, which took away the context for the story because I wanted to know, could he read the words? And he had no idea. He could read a few words, but he could no longer read in the way that he had been assumed to be able to read. It made me concerned about both his uh, potential for learning language uh, and what we needed to do about that, and also to encourage him to be a reader. When he was very little, so he arrived at, at four and a half and kind of in the first year of school, his concentration was pretty awful. That wasn't a big surprise, really, given all the trauma that he'd had. However, every evening after dinner, we would sit at the table and he would sit on either my lap or my husband's and he would draw. And he was not good at drawing at that point. So when he drew his pictures, he would talk and there would always be a story that he was telling with his pictures. They were very active with loads of scribble. So it'd be a shark attacking another fish or something that he was interested in. He was very interested in animals. So a lot of the stories had animals, monsters, fighting, you know, typical kids kind of stories. And he would tell us the story as he went along. So then we started to make story books. So he would tell me the story as he drew it and I would write it down. And then we would take the pictures and cut them out or change them a bit or add to them and make a little book with the story. So the writing at the bottom. And then he would take it into school and he had a really nice teacher who could see some of his struggle. And he would read his story, although he didn't read it very well, he just remembered it, to the class. So he was getting the experience all the time of stories being important and seeing himself as a reader. We also made sure that he had lots and lots of audio books and also that we read stories to him that were harder than he could ever read. Um, we got picture books for him to read, so comic books that he could read himself because they really didn't have any words in them. We deliberately chose them to be like that. So he learned to see himself as a reader. And when I realised all the trouble he was having, talked to the school, but he wasn't far enough behind and he wasn't naughty. So he was never going to be seen by anybody who'd investigate that further and give them some advice about what to do. Um, so I did some work with him using the Ladybird reading scheme, right old fashioned scheme, which is focused on sight words. The great thing about it is book one's got no words. Book two's got maybe one word or two words. Book three might have four words and that's all. Um, you would think it was boring, but actually it worked really well with him because he gradually developed a sight vocabulary. And that's what the books were for. Then he could fill in some of the words between on his own. So he could read some long words because he knew what they're likely to be from his vocabulary and his vocabulary was good. So he could guess dinosaur from the context. And he was always a reader who used context. So although if you took away the story, he couldn't really read. With a story, he could get the flow and then he could make sensible guesses. So eventually we did take him for an assessment. And I was thinking about that because I, I'm not overly keen on the diagnosis of dyslexia. However, how do you get people to take note? Uh, and that is a way that they would uh, listen to the fact that or accept the fact that he had a difficulty with reading because his problem was always that he was a bright kid, articulate, interested, very curious and yet was having these difficulties. But he wasn't very far behind at that point anyway. His spelling was atrocious and his handwriting was dreadful and often he wrote in reverse. Um, however, he was still not falling massively behind average, um, but he was having all these difficulties. So he kind of had a strange pattern. But what he did have was this view of himself as somebody who might be able to learn to read that was established quite young. 
even though he had this period where he didn't want to read books, he didn't want to see them anymore. Um, at that point, we took him for the assessment because we couldn't bear it anymore. But until that point, we were doing OK. And I think what happened there is, you know, he went through a bad time and he was struggling with the work going up on the wall and his work being obviously poor compared with the other kids. And he could see that himself. And I think that was part of it. He had some intervention um, to help him with the reading, individual lessons. And he was able to make better progress. And interestingly, as he became older, he always was a writer. He always wanted to write. He always wrote stories. Um, when he was young and older, you know, kind of early teens, he would dictate stories to me and I would write them down. Or he would type them on the computer and we'd turn them into books. Um, but stuff that he made for himself for his own pleasure. It wasn't to show anybody else. Gradually, he became much more confident with that and was prepared to show people. He didn't really read a, a proper kind of chapter book until he was about 11. And by then, he had developed this idea of himself as able to read. When he was at secondary school, he struggled with that a bit, but could perform extremely well in English, depending on the teacher, or extremely badly. When he went to high school, kind of uh, for his GCSEs, he was in a mixed ability class. And that was good for him because it gave him some people he could be better than and some people who were better than him. There was a list on the wall of books you could read. Uh, and the teacher gave out Mars bars for whoever had read the most books. And for some reason, he decided that was going to be him. So he kept on winning the Mars bars for reading. Um, and reading for him was a slow process. It was a real struggle and it would take him much longer to read books than other people. But he liked them. He liked the stories and he liked being able to read. He liked all the trappings around it and sitting there with a book. So he went on to do really well in his English GCSE and to take English A-levels. And I think he got two A's at his A-levels. Now, if that goes absolutely against a fixed idea of somebody who might be described as having dyslexia. I mean, he has a diagnosis and he still struggles to read some things, but he is now a teacher. So he is in classrooms with kids and he is showing kids that it's possible to struggle and then to do well. Uh, and I think that was the kind of idea that we wanted to encourage with him, that Yes, reading was harder for him to learn than other people, but you can still be a reader, you can still be a writer, and you can become expert enough to teach somebody else. Uh, and I'm delighted that he does that now. That was not an expected outcome, but that is what he does. So his construing of himself has been so crucial to that progress. Without his idea of himself as a learner and able to learn, he would not have been able to do that. And I think one of the aspects of the individual teaching that he had was about being with him on his own, away from the eyes of the other pupils, and letting him have a lesson which was nicely targeted to be at the right level for him. So very careful planning. You know, I know very well that some kids, despite all the best intervention delivered and the most researched programmes being given, they really struggle to learn to read. So what is it about them? Is it that reading is impossible for some people? I really don't think that's likely. Or is it that actually we need to do a bit more exploration of what's going on there and why it is that somebody can read and at the same level of difficulty, somebody else isn't making any progress at all? It comes back to Tom's argument that we need to look at the individual. And we need to think about what it is that they're seeing in themselves and in their situation. One of the things that might be useful to explore this is a systemic bow tie. So Harry Proctor has developed this idea. So let's take a situation with a child and a tutor. Uh, and the tutor is trying to get the child to read better. So the pupil might have this 
construing of themselves, which is that they're stupid and they can't learn to read. That's their construction. So their action in relation to that is they're distractible. They find it hard to keep looking at the page. They think about other things. They don't tackle the task in the way that means they're going to find it easier to learn because they're not paying attention very well. The tutor looks at the distractibility of that child and thinks that kid is hard to teach. So their construction of the child as hard to teach leads to their action of dividing the task into small steps. So making it so that it's very accessible. The pupil then could accept that. But in this case, the pupil sees that as here's more evidence that I'm stupid. The teacher's having to make the task so easy for me. This is babyish work. I don't want to do this because it's confirming that I'm stupid. That systemic bow tie is a really quick and easy thing to use. So you go from construct to action for the two people. But what you get is the picture of a bow tie because you're crossing over. So it goes, pupil thinks I'm stupid. His action is distractible. Up to the construing of the teacher, which is he's hard to teach. And then an action going down, which is I'm going to put in a small steps program, which feeds back up to the pupil's construction of I must be stupid. You could do a version of drawing the ideal self, which is focused on being a reader. So taking that role and you could have, um, first of all, the same kind of idea of, OK, let's take this person who is a non-reader doesn't read and can't read. Um, What kind of person are they? And then what's in their bag? And then how do they get on with their teachers at school? And what are they like with other kids? And I would keep the focus on being in an education setting mostly, but I would definitely have in reading practice at home. And so this person who is a non-reader, what do they do about reading practice at home? Because it is something kids are expected to do with their parents. In lots of ways, that's a really ridiculous idea because how on earth can parents teach kids to read? They haven't had any training. Uh, all they can do is practice. And they may not do that well. I know lots of parents who've really struggled with that. And certainly when my own son was having difficulty, doing his reading practice was an absolute nightmare because he didn't want to face the struggle of it. I don't blame him either. I didn't, to be honest. I didn't want to do it, but it had to be done. Um, So then I would also have, how did this person get to be like this? How did they become a non-reader? And what's their future going to be? Include what's their greatest fear? So you'd want to know for this, before you do the history and the future, what would be the greatest fear of someone like this who doesn't read, can't read. And then you go to join the ideal reader. So this would be somebody who's a fantastic reader. Uh, And you go through the same process and then get the child to do a rating scale where they rate themselves along that construct from the person who's not a reader up to the person who's a fantastic reader and see where they place themselves. And I would be very interested to get them to say where they thought teachers would put them along there. So would teachers place them, you know, as somebody who's a better reader than they think they are? That's important. Are their parents aware of the difficulty they're having? Or do they think they're having more difficulty or less difficulty than the child thinks they're having? How about brothers and sisters? Because they're always witness to reading practice at home. Uh, And from my point of view with my son, that was always very, very difficult. Because when we were doing the reading practice, that was one of the ways his sister, who sat in the same room or nearby, learnt to read. So she heard what was going on. She could see the book sometimes because he wanted to read it to her. And she learnt to read and he still struggled. The, the views of siblings are formed quite early. So it's very important to think about that. So you might want them to place where their brother or sister would put them on this line of non-reader to reader. The other thing would be to think about where people like a head teacher or if the child's had any specialist assessment, how they think that person construed them. 
as a non-reader or reader. It may be they've seen an educational psychologist and they think the psychologist thought they were brilliant. It's going to be a bit more difficult to get someone to do reading practice if they've got a construct like that. So you need to tackle it. The whole point of assessment is so that you can come up with some ideas for what you can do to address the issues. There's no point doing any assessment if it's not going to lead to you taking some action which helps somebody. It might be interesting, but it's not going to be useful. So you'd be thinking, OK, if this child thinks the educational psychologist thought they were brilliant, how are we going to set up reading tasks that mean that this child sees them as relevant to them? And you'd have to work on that. So I mean, these kind of things where you're working with an individual who's really not making progress require a great deal of creativity. So you might deliberately texts that are written with a more intellectual content, but with easy read. So you could have a book about, for instance, uh, something to do with science, rockets. And it, it, you might have to write it yourself, but it could have easy language, but difficult concepts so that that child's view of themselves as clever and doing really well in reading is not destroyed but you can still teach them to read. In the same way, you could try something for those kids who see themselves as absolutely a non-reader. Uh, and I did some work with a girl where we worked on reading using chocolate wrappers and crisp packets because that's what she knew she could read at that point. And actually, you can. If you, if you can read salt and vinegar uh, and you can recognise salt on its own, you can then read halt. And you can read some other words. So trying to think of ways to get into that child's construing is the key to them learning. OK, well, hopefully that's given you some food for thought. I would suggest if you're working with children on learning, go away and have a think about that. You might want to read Tom's paper. So it is in his collected papers book and I'll put the reference in the notes. You don't necessarily need to go back and read that. What you could do is think about this and think, do I, as a practitioner, spend enough time working out for this individual what it is that's going on for them, how they see reading and how they see themselves as a reader? Because that's going to be the key to moving on. If you can design a program which fits with the child's construing of self, you're likely to get much more success. OK. Well, that's the end for today. Um, I hope you'll come back and listen to some more ramblings. We've got a couple of interviews in the pipeline. So it may be in the next one that we have an interview with Adele Pyle, who is a speech and language therapist. Because what I want to do on this podcast is to show how different people from different professions are using PCP and why it matters to them. So we've got a few things lined up. And in between those, I'll do some drawing your attention to some papers that I think are important. You might disagree, but, you know, you can always switch me off. <laughs> OK, I'll see you next month. Thanks very much. Bye.